Hi, welcome to a new episode, in the Internet Surfer, hosting the most horror, and creepiest stories, from Reddit. Please, don't forget, to comment, like, share, and subscribe. Enjoy. Orion Pest Control Dog Days A long horror story from Reddit Nosleep. The client called with complaints of encountering centipedes frequently in his home. While a lot of people find centipedes creepy, they are harmless. First thing we had to do was an inspection. Find out how the centipedes were getting in. See if there is something such as a water leak that could be causing excessive moisture in the client's home. Centipedes love dark, damp places, which is why you will often find them in basements, shower drains, and crawl spaces. Once we had a chance to scope out the situation, we could develop a treatment plan from there. Armed with insecticides, Reina and I arrived to combat the invasion. The first thing I noticed when the client answered the door was that he looked sickly. He apologized, saying that he had food poisoning, so he was going to keep his distance from us. Where have you been finding the centipedes the most? I questioned. Bedroom. He said as he weakly settled down onto the couch. That's why I'm camped out here. Those things freak me out. How about the basement? Bathrooms? He shook his head. I thought that the location of the infestation was unusual, but otherwise I did not think much of it. We inspected the bedroom, starting under the bed. Sure enough, I found two common house centipedes squirming under a pile of old yearbooks. They got a lovely dose of insecticide. During the inspection, I noticed the windows did not have the best seal. That was how they were getting in. The client began to cough from the other room, which turned into wrenching. That does not sound good. When I approached him to see if he was all right, he doubled over his garbage can. Instead of vomit, the long, leggy body of a centipede wriggled out of his mouth. He suddenly clutched his nose, wailing as he pulled another squirming bug from his right nostril. It took all my willpower not to flinch at the sight. The centipedes were not coming from outside. As I rushed to his side, Reina told me then that she knew what this was. Good. That was why we hired her. I told her to get whatever she needed while I watched over the client. Before she hurried off with the company truck, she paused to say, if you can, look for a white centipede. Trap it, but do not kill it. Naturally, the client was inconsolable. I think anyone would be, in his situation. Why is this happening to me? He whimpered. I tried to be comforting, my co-worker is knowledgeable when it comes to human infestations, so once she comes back, we'll take care of it, alright? I will try anything. I can, the client shuddered, his hands clutching at his gut. I can feel them crawling in my stomach. Their legs dash. I rubbed his back as he bent over the garbage can again. Jesus. I hoped that Reina could help him, and soon. Once he was done, he trembled as he watched the centipedes writhe at the bottom of his trash can. I asked him if he would be okay if I left him for a second. He nodded. While he sobbed on the couch, I doused the bugs that he had thrown up with a hefty dose of insecticide, then the hunt for the white centipede was on. At first, I tried not to tear the bedroom apart too much, but then I figured that the client would rather have to do some cleaning than have more bugs crawling around his insides. It was not under the bed. Or under the dresser. The closet? Three regular, brown centipedes scurried away as I swung the door open. I stomped on one, but lost track of the other. I would get it later. I moved some boxes of old comics that he had on the floor around. Not there. Somewhere else in the house. I went to the kitchen next. Nothing under the counters besides some sizable dust bunnies. While I was there, the client asked for a glass of water, telling me that he had cups in the cabinet by the sink. That is where I found the white centipede. It reared up on its hind legs, staring at me as its long body swayed from side to side. 
something stringy was tied around one of its segments in a small bow. Hair. I quickly seized a glass and placed it over the white centipede to trap it. It kept looking at me. When I glanced between the client and the hair wrapped around the white centipede, I saw that the color and texture of the hair matched his. Reina burst through the door with a plastic bag on her arm. I do not know what I expected her to pull out, but it was not fruit and extra virgin olive oil. I did not recognize the fruit, even after she started hurriedly chopping it, it looked like some sort of cross between a lime and an orange. Seeing my expression, she muttered, I know this probably looks ridiculous, but just, trust me, okay? I nodded slowly. I then informed her that I had caught the white centipede. She seemed relieved. Okay, perfect. Can you put some of this oil on the stove for me on like, medium heat? Despite my confusion, I did as she asked. After she was done cutting, she slid the slices of mystery fruit into the oiled pan with a loud sizzle. What was interesting was that during this process, the white centipede had become frantic in its glass prison. It wasted time, its legs clinking against the cup, desperate for an escape. After the fruit oil mixture became a jelly-like goop, Reina poured most of it into a mug, announcing that once it cooled off, it would be ready. When presented with the mixture, the client drank it without question. He was so desperate for some sort of relief that he had truly meant it when he had said that he was willing to try anything. As he sipped at it, Reina motioned for me to follow her back into the kitchen. Next, we need to submerge the centipede. She explained. That'll redirect the curse onto the person that originally cast it. All right, sounds good. I replied, using a plate to keep the white centipede trapped within its glass prison as I picked it up. You've seen this before, I take it? She nodded. Yeah, but normally, it is beetles instead of centipedes. The calamansi mixture I gave him will keep the nasty little shits from eating our client from the inside out. I swear, the white centipede screamed as we poured the calamansi stuff over it. Centipedes are not normally capable of vocalizing. It twitched as its legs got stuck in the silly fruit mixture. Its struggles eventually died down, becoming slower and slower until the white centipede finally went still. After confirming that the white centipede was dead, we checked on the client. He looked relieved to report that he could not feel anything squirming in his stomach anymore. Reina gently informed the client that the curse was brought about by jealousy. There was someone out there that envied him enough to want him dead, and in a gruesome manner, at that. If we had gotten to him a day later, the centipedes would have tunneled their way out of his body from every orifice. Lovely, right? The calamansi mixture acts as a return to sender. She explained. The person who did this to you will experience everything that you just went through until they put a stop to the curse. In the meantime, be careful. I will return later with a charm that should help protect you. While Victor and I are well versed in infestations affecting homes and business, we still have a lot to learn about atypical parasites such as the one that this client dealt with. That is where Reina comes in. I am not entirely sure what the best word to describe her title is, since she resents the term spiritual healer and others like it due to their associations with quack medicine. In summary, at Orion, we have all been learning from each other. Speaking of Victor, on the drive back to the office, Reina and I discussed the changes we had noticed in him. Neither of us have seen him eat anything since he showed up looking like hell. My vote's still for vampire. She spoke. Just a different flavor of vampire than the ones my Lola told me about to scare me into going to bed on time. Jokes on her though, her stories made me afraid of the dark, so I did not sleep anyway. I was not convinced. Victor had witnessed me managing to cut myself with a tape dispenser the other day and had no reaction to the blood beyond cracking wise at me. He was in his office when we returned, looking like he wanted to strangle whoever he was on the phone with. That was common. The boss is not the best with people, which is why I end up handling most of the customer service duties. After Victor hung up, he informed us that it was the Department of Wildlife. 
The worms were going around the local deer population, so they wanted us to keep an eye out and let them know if we notice any other species of animals showing symptoms. That made my stomach drop. That was the absolute last thing I wanted to hear. After that wonderful news, Reyna went to take her lunch break, leaving Victor and I alone. Before speaking, he gave me a pointed stare, listen. Nessa, I get you are concerned about me, but you need to back off. That took me aback, but before I could respond, he continued, I do not want to see you following me anywhere, all right? Just stick to doing your job. Following him. Oh. Oh. I understand. I muttered. There had to be a reason he could not talk to me outright. Something was up. His message was clear, he wanted me to follow him, but make sure that I was not seen, even by him. After the office closed, I left first, pulling my car behind a dilapidated barn spray painted with Jesus saves. Repent. It was just down the road from where he lived, close enough to his apartment that I could see him pull in, but far enough away that my little G6 would not be noticeable. Sure enough, Fifteen minutes later, his battered truck passed by. I could not help but feel creepy, like I was doing something wrong. I was stalking him. But was it really stalking if the person asked you to do it? For about twenty minutes after he went inside, nothing happened. I was not entirely sure what I was supposed to be looking for. I had already missed something important. His front door opened. Victor exited circling around to enter the forest surrounding his apartment. Quickly, I drove over, abandoned my car in visitor's parking, and followed him past the tree lean, hoping that I did not lose him. I made sure to bring my tool belt with me. Like hell was I going into this unprepared. Unfortunately, I had arrived late. He was not in sight. Oh no. Hold on. I examined the forest floor, finding fresh boot prints in the dirt, damp from the rain earlier that day. I followed them deeper into the woods, doing my best to stay silent as I avoided fallen branches as best as I could. As I went deeper and deeper into the woods, I heard whispering. It was incredibly faint, almost imperceptible. It would have been easy to dismiss as nothing more than the rustling of leaves. I was sure that it was not Victor's voice. I looked around, trying to find the source of it, but from what I could see, I was alone. Cautiously, I continued following Victor's boot prints, hand poised over my container of salt. I knew better than to brush something like that off as my imagination or just the wind. The whispers suddenly became more urgent, louder, yet I still could not make out what they were saying. It might have been a man's voice. They were coming from the right, veering away from the boss tracks. When I tried to focus on what was being said, I suddenly found myself off the path. How did I get here? I glanced around, seeing my own footprints behind me. I did not remember walking this way. Something out there was messing with my head. I got my bearings and went back the way I came. The whispers were at my back. Stomach in a knot, I ignored them. I found Victor's trail again. The whispers were suddenly close. Remarkably close, as if the speaker were right next to me. It took most of my concentration to shut out what they were saying. I clenched my jaw, trying to give myself something else to focus on. It was becoming harder and harder to follow Victor, but I could not let myself get led astray again. I did not want to know where the whispers would take me if I focused on them for too long. There was a clearing up ahead. The whispers were aggressive, now, my right ear ringing. My mind felt fuzzy, as if filled with TV static. But I still did not listen to them, using every ounce of will be left to reach the clearing. I even went as far as to plug my ears with my fingers. All at once, the whispering stopped. I glanced around the clearing, too afraid to uncover my ears. One of the trees caught my eye. Warily, I got closer. Encased within the bark was a human skull. The trunk had grown around the cranium so that the gaping mouth and eye sockets were the only things visible. 
another tree nearby. The roots twisted around a set of rib bones. The trunk was smaller than the one next to it, as the tree was younger. It grew from the broken jaws of another person's skull. I also could not help but notice that the bones were not as eroded as the ones I found stuck in the other tree. I am not supposed to be here. A voice made me jump, what brings you out here, stranger? I whirled around, seeing that the mechanic lounged in a folding chair, gently strumming a banjo. The face of the instrument was adorned with black dragonflies flitting about, the wooden neck accented with swirls of gold. I had bet money that it was hand-painted. He looked as if he had been there for hours, but he was not there before. My heart raced as the phone call with that kid from three years ago played on a loop in my mind. The blood-soaked petals of the hawthorn tree. I swallowed nervously, trying to keep a tremble from my voice, making sure to avoid his eyes, I'm looking for someone. The mechanic smiled, fancy that. I am looking for someone, too. I am following a trail. I do not want it to go cold, so if you please would excuse me dash. He cheerily ignored me, you wouldn't happen to be looking for old blue eyes, would? Oh no. What did the mechanic want with Victor? Something crucial that yins need to know if you ever encounter the neighbors is to never lie to them. They will know it. You can, however, conceal the truth if you are clever about it. I'm seeking answers. I said vaguely. The mechanic continued his soft tune as he gave me a mysterious look, you think following that trail will get you to him? It ends right in front of you. My heart sank as I saw that he was right. The mechanic then said, you want to find him, you're going to need some help. Another thing about the neighbors is that they take debt seriously. I had compared them to the mafia once before, and it is not an exaggeration. An unfulfilled deal with a neighbor would make cement shoes seem like a peaceful way to go. I tried to be polite, I appreciate the offer, but I'm afraid that I must decline. The mechanic chuckled, the sound chilling me to the marrow. Nah, you are getting my help, whether you like it or not. You can either accept it graciously, or, well. Either way, you will be finding him for me. Simple as. I swallowed again, mind racing to try to find a way out of this. I could not decide which option terrified me more, being indebted to the mechanic or angering him. I made sure not to meet his gaze as he watched me deliberate. The song he played was different than the one I had heard over the phone years ago. The tune he played now was calming, like a lullaby. I regret the answer that I gave him, but at the time, I had thought it was reasonable. I was stupid. Please learn from my mistakes. Your offer is gracious and appreciated, but I must respectfully refuse. I am afraid that the cost dash. The mechanic sighed, sounding frustrated, anyone ever tell you it's rude not to look people in the eyes when you speak to them? Oh no. I back paddled, I meant no offense dash. The peaceful melody stopped as he gave the strings of the instrument one quick strum. It felt like someone took a sledgehammer to both of my kneecaps at once. Pitching forward, I gasped for air, unable to cry out. Another strum. My fingers clenched into fists involuntarily. There was a sharp sensation under my fingernails as if they were being pried off. Still, I could not find the breath to scream. From the fog of agony, I heard another flick of the banjo strings. With it, my spine twisted, and my vision went dark. I had thought that was it. That he had broken my bones with nothing but a swipe of his fingers and left me for dead. I was wrong. When my eyes opened, I was still in the forest. The mechanic had stayed in his chair, arms bent behind his head, eyes closed as he basked in the golden glow of the setting sun. He had propped the banjo against his chair. I now feared that instrument more than any weapon made by man. My fingernails lied on the ground in front of me, a brown liquid covering them. Blood. Why did my blood look like that? What at first looked like pale, shiny stones turned out to be teeth upon closer examination. Everything looked, strange now. 
muted, as if most of the color had drained from the world. Numbly, I noticed that there was something taking up the bottom of my vision. Long and white, tipped with black. No, no way. I tilted my head, looking down to see white paws instead of hands. I opened my mouth to swear, but all that came out was a high-pitched yelp. The mechanic opened his eyes, grinning at me as he taunted, you just had to be stubborn. I slowly stood, disoriented over how small I felt. The forest was now entirely too loud. The cacophony of smells overwhelmed me. I tried to speak, but all that came out was a bark. The mechanic sat up, deceptively boyish grin still in place, you know, I respect you, puppy dog. Know why? All your bones broke as your body remolded itself, your flesh stretched out like silly putty, and all your little teeth and nails got yanked out. But through all that, you did not scream. Not even once. I could not do anything but watch him, my whole body shaking from fear and the ache I felt in every cell of my being that came from my forced transformation. It had not been bravery that had kept me from crying out. He leaned forward, clasping his hands together, so here's the deal, you find old blue eyes for me, and you will be back on two legs again. But if you take too long, you will begin to forget that you were ever human to begin with. You are understanding me, puppy dog. The mechanic picked up his instrument again. Frozen, I resisted the urge to flinch as his fingers grazed the strings. My ears were so sensitive now that I could hear every groove of his fingerprints as they softly touched the instrument. Not bothering to look up at me, he said, you have got until tomorrow's sunrise. You might want to get a wiggle on. I wanted to run, fast and far, but I could not. It took everything that I had not to devolve into utter panic. I had to find Victor. The mechanic had said he was going to help me, whether I liked it or not. How was turning me into a dog helpful? Okay. I had to think. Stop being afraid and think. I closed my eyes, trying not to stare at my snout anymore. I inhaled deeply the sense of fresh leaves and wet dirt heavy in my nose. And something else. Opening my eyes, I followed the scent. Victor's footprints. Why did I smell death on him? The rotting, pungent smell of carrion was faint, but enough that I could follow it. I padded forward, allowing my nose to guide me. God, I was so small. Or the world just felt so much bigger. The scent trail leads me past a pond. Even though my mind felt like it was about to break, I was morbidly curious about what I looked like. When I stared at my reflection, a white, floppy-eared pit bull stared back at me. Little black spots like freckles speckled my face. As stupid as it sounds, one of my first thoughts was, at least he didn't turn me into some yappy little ankle biter. I shuddered as the dog in the pond, and I retreated from each other. When I felt that hopeless feeling creeping up again, I reminded myself that I had plenty of time to find the boss. I would be human again. With another deep breath through my nose, I kept following the smell of decay. The creaks of branches sounded like the earth shattering. The songs of birds were tinny and sharp, making a whimper rise from my throat. From far off, something's teeth ground together nauseatingly as it chewed. God. How do dogs and not go insane hearing so much all the time? I tried to simply focus on following the trail. A woodpecker sounded like a jackhammer, making me jump. Every sound put me on edge. It all seemed so close, as if I were surrounded, caged by the trees around me. Even though the sun went all the way down, I could still navigate through the trees well. The scent was starting to get stronger. I hoped that meant that I was getting closer. The trail led me to a shed in the middle of a field. From where I stood at the edge of the woods, I could smell blood yet again. It looked like a butcher's shed. Why would Victor be here? I approached the shed, ears pricked for any indication of what I would find inside. The shed was completely silent. Stealing myself, I stalked towards the entrance, finding that the door was cracked open. 
I nudged it open, seeing Victor bent over a counter, a partially processed deer in front of him. It looked like chunks had been taken out of its torso. A knife sat near to him and a pair of discarded rubber gloves. With how good my hearing was, I should have heard his heartbeat. Why didn't I? He turned his head when the door creaked open. Ordinarily, we were at the same eye level. It felt strange having to look up at him. It was even stranger to have him coo at me, oh, hey there, puppy. I did not realize his voice could go that high. Oh God, which was far too weird. A drawn out whine exited my mouth, it was the only way to express how weirded out I was. What's wrong? The boss asked, crouching down, hand outstretched. It is okay. I am nice. Great. I had found him, but how was I going to get him to know who I really was? I tapped my nose against his palm, then circled towards the door, staring at him, willing him to follow me. I whined again, trying to look pathetic. It was not hard. I certainly felt it. The boss rose back up, approaching me like he was afraid to startle me. I padded out the door, turning back to see if he followed. I may not have been able to speak, but I still knew how to write. I used the claws of my right paw to dig at the dirt, making an H. The floor creaked as he left the shed to see what I was doing. I kept pawing at the dirt until I spelled out, help. His brows furrowed, glancing between me and the message. I whined again, head down, wishing that I could cry. Victor's hand delicately went under my jaw, gently urging me to look up at him. He examined my face intently, searching for something. He must have found it. His eyes widened as he breathed, Nessa. I whimpered again, trembling as he held my chin. Victor's other hand stroked my head, trying to comfort me. What did this? He asked. I raised my head, leading him back towards the mechanic's clearing. The journey back felt like an eternity. Victor was silent, his expression grave for the duration of the hike. The smell of blood, meat, and rot lingered with him. What had he been doing in that shed? The mechanic had started a fire and acquired a case of beer, at some point. He was roasting a marshmallow when we arrived. It caught on fire. People say I'm weird for liking my marshmallows burnt. He commented before he blew it out. Not sure why. It is the best way to do it. Victor ignored him, you wanted me, you got me. Now will you please change her back? The mechanic twirled the stick between his fingers, the firelight making his smile look sinister, I'll get to that. How much time did I have before sunrise? It was hard to tell with the way my vision had changed. It still looked dark but that did not stop me from becoming even more nervous than I already was. What if he just stalled until sunrise, even though I had done what I was supposed to? Could he do that? I glanced up at Victor, the terror probably apparent in my eyes. He was smart enough not to push it, though I could tell he wanted to, thinking the same thing as I was. Why did you want me? Victor asked, the tightness in his eyes the only evidence I could see of his growing rage. The mechanic did not seem bothered by it, trapping his burnt marshmallow between a pair of graham crackers and a sliver of chocolate. Do you know who I am, blue eyes? I have my suspicions. Victor all but growled. Then you know very well why I brought you here and what your options are. Victor did not say anything for a moment, looking even more pale in the flickers of the flames in front of him as he watched the mechanic devour his burnt smoke. The boss heart still was not beating. I began to wonder how long Victor had been dead. And with that, how long I had been a complete idiot and not known. Victor eventually said, please, turn my colleague back into a person. I will make my choice then. The mechanic laughed, shaking his head, you got some nerve, boy. I pawed at Victor's leg. I wished I could tell him not to push his luck with the mechanic, like I had. The mechanic then said, we have had a good working relationship over the years, what with the truck and whatnot. 
I am giving you a choice out the kindness of my heart. Normally, I just take the ones I want without a second thought. But you have been a valued customer over the years. Figure this was the least I could do. Victor's icy gaze did not thaw any, but I could tell that beneath the fury, he was afraid. I did not know what his choices were, but I am sure that it was a similar, damned if you do, damned if you don't, deal to what I got. Victor swallowed before taking a deep breath in. He finally answered, if I agree, what happens? The mechanic took a swig from his beer bottle, then replied, you just keep on managing Orion, same as usual. All that is going to happen is that you will have some extra calls from time to time. Calls that only you will answer. You will have no longer than two days to complete each one. And you will not be able to refuse anything assigned to you. I had a feeling that the mechanic was not referring to some hornet nests. What would a neighbor consider a pest? With a chill, I produced the answer myself, us. Humans. They were here before us. We cut down their forests. Poison their water. For Victor's sake, and for the sakes of nameless others, I hoped that I was wrong. I had taken lives in Afghanistan, and I regret every single one. They still haunt my nightmares to this day, no matter how long it has been since I was discharged. I think they will always be there. I caught Victor estimating the trees nearby. Another skull leered at us from the truck, the firelight making it look like it was trying to speak. Seemingly transfixed by the skeleton, Victor eventually let out a shuddering breath before saying, I'll do it. The mechanic smirked at him, good choice, blue eyes. When he reached for the banjo, it took everything I had not to cower from it. The mechanic smiled at me, since you did such a good job, I'll be a bit nicer. The melody he played was hypnotic, slow, enchanting. I blinked as my head suddenly felt, cloudy, is the best word I could think of for it. Pleasantly cloudy. And I was tired. So tired. It became harder and harder to keep my eyes open. The grass felt softer than any mattress I had ever laid upon. I curled up in it, the fresh smell of it relaxing me even further as I let my eyes drift closed. Then I woke up in my bed, groggy. Why was I awake? I wanted to keep sleeping. I reached up to rub my eyes. A hand. I was me again. I was sore all over, as if I had done a hundred crunches on hardwood floor. As embarrassing as it is to admit, I bawled like a baby. I am taking the next few days off to recover. The boss was the one to suggest it. I need it. He apologized for leading me there. He had not anticipated the mechanic finding me. I did not blame him. It was not his fault. I encourage all of you to learn from my mistakes. If a neighbor gives you an offer you cannot refuse, take the choice that gets you out as unscathed as possible. I got off lightly. Do not mess around with them. Be smart. Be careful. Thanks for watching. Please comment, like, share and subscribe. The Internet Surfer on YouTube for more horror and scary stories.